Good afternoon. Thanks everybody for joining us today. My name is Alyssa Doroff and I'm the cyber technical leader here at NFP based in New York City. I'm very pleased to have Jake Olcott of BitSight here with me today. Jake is going to talk to us about BitSight's proprietary security rating system, how it measures an organization's overall security posture based on a number of factors, which Jake will walk us through. He'll also talk about BitSight's observations and the probability of certain organizations falling prey to a ransomware attack. Lastly, he'll provide some recommendations to avoid being a target. For those of you who don't know Jake, he has a very impressive background. I'm going to try and sum it up. He is the Vice President of Communications and Government Affairs for BitSight, the Standard and Security Ratings. He previously served as Legal and Policy Advisor on Cybersecurity Issues to the U.S. Senate Commerce Committee and U.S. House of Representatives Homeland Security Committee. Prior to BitSight, he advised Fortune 1000 executives on cybersecurity governance and technology issues. Jake also served as an adjunct professor on cybersecurity at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. He holds degrees from the University of Texas at Austin and the University of Virginia School of Law. For those of you who do not know BitSight, they are the leader in cybersecurity ratings. The BitSight security ratings platform applies sophisticated algorithms producing daily security ratings that range from 250 to 900 to help organizations manage their own security performance, mitigate third-party risk, underwrite cyber insurance policies, conduct financial diligence, and assess aggregate risk. In addition to working closely with several insurance companies, BitSight also assists us here at NFP in helping our clients gauge their overall cybersecurity posture. Before we get started, just a quick note on logistics. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box and we'll answer them as they become relevant throughout the presentation or at the end. With that said, I'm going to turn it over to Jake to get started. Alyssa, thank you so much. Um, and uh, good, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, depending on uh, where you are. I'm here in Washington, D.C., uh, and we are having uh, some fabulous weather today. It is in the uh, high 70s, low 80s, um, very unusual for us um, in, in August. I hope things are, are good uh, wherever you are. Um, uh, Alyssa, thank you so much for uh, inviting, inviting us to, uh, to come and, and have a conversation um, about some of the findings um, uh, that we're going to get into with respect to our ransomware research. I'm looking forward to sharing that uh, with the group. As Alyssa said, um, also, I, I, uh, I, I've got some slides to work through, but I'd love for this to be um, also a, a conversation, uh, too. I'm happy to, um, you know, pause at any point. If folks have questions on something that I said, please go ahead and just, you know, type them in, into the uh, into the Q&A. Just the way that I have things set up right now, I, I'm I'm not able to see you typing in uh, the Q and A, but I've asked Alyssa to uh, just kind of interrupt me as we as we go, so um, so I can get to some of your questions uh, as we go along. So um, so anyway, very excited to uh, to to be here uh, again. And the way that I've just kind of divided up the presentation here, um, I just want to spend you know just a couple minutes uh, telling you a little bit about um, BitSight and how we um, how we collect data, how we approach uh, the cybersecurity. Um, issue slash problem. Um, and then I, I want to spend some time just kind of sharing with you uh, some of the research um, that we've done over the last uh, number of months related to, to ransomware. I know this is a, you know, an issue that is on, um, it's on everybody's mind. I'm sure that, you know, your executives are thinking about this uh, as well. And so we, we wanted to publish this research to get it out into the community so that, you know, organizations can start to think about um, proactive ways about how to how to address this challenge. So, um, so if you're okay with that, uh, we can just go ahead and uh, and get started here. And um, and I'll, you know, so I'll just kind of start with just a um, just a minute or two um, about BitSight. We we uh, we just celebrated our our 10 year anniversary. Company's been been around uh, since 2011. Headquartered up in up in Boston. Um, uh, you know, a great a great customer base across. Um, uh, across a variety of different uh, areas, you know, just at a high level, as as Alyssa's saying, you know, BitSight is sort of known for um, our security performance ratings, which I'm just going to spend a second um, talking about. That's a a rating that looks very similar to a consumer credit score. It's a 250 to 900 rating, and um, you know, essentially what we're doing is we're collecting a massive amount of data uh, about cybersecurity performance. We're assigning that data to organizations. Um, and so that 
that rating that you see, that 250 to 900 rating, um, is indicative of an organization's overall security performance across a variety of different categories. I'm going to spend just a second talking about this in, um, in just a minute here. Um, but uh, there's there's a lot of different you know reasons and and use cases for for you know why folks are interested in 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 these ratings. Um, Alyssa sort of got into them, so we're you know servicing a lot of governments, a lot of um, companies, large and small, and certainly you know in in cyber insurance, we're really pleased to be a partner um, working with NFP as well. So let me just spend a second just talking about this um, uh, talking about this performance rating. Um, you know, so if you think about the the model that it's built on, the consumer credit model, you know, we can go um, you know months or years, um, you know, routinely paying our bills uh, on time and maintaining a strong um, credit rating. Um, but as everybody knows, you know, you you miss a payment uh, or two, and um, and and your rating, your credit rating starts to go south. Why? It, it's you know indicative of you know things that may be happening. Um, you know, inside your your personal financial life, you know, maybe there's a a job issue, something's happening uh, that's leading you to um, uh, to miss some of these payments. When you start making your payments again, your credit rating doesn't immediately rebound. It rebounds over a period of time because you're able to demonstrate consistent uh, payment, um, um, and and that's exactly what we're trying to measure too in a cybersecurity um, sense. So the BitSight rating is a is a you know continuous objective data driven rating um, leveraging a lot of different um, data sets. Um, you know a lower rating is um, is actually a greater indicator um, that you'll experience uh, a cyber incident. Uh, whether you know, we're sort of specifically looking at you know major data breaches, um, have some research to share with you uh, as we go about. Uh, ransomware probability and how that's correlated with the BitSight rating. But, you know, think of this as an ongoing uh, continuous performance rating um, where, you know, strong cybersecurity is represented by a higher rating and weaker cybersecurity is represented by a lower rating. There are a variety of different data sets uh, that BitSight is collecting. Um, in fact, 250 billion uh, security measurements that we're collecting on a on a daily basis. And what we do is we, we bucket those observations into different categories. Uh, so there's the, you know, the high level rating, that 250 to 900 rating. But what we try to do is we try to um, divide all of the different observations that we're making across a variety of different um, vectors. We call these risk vectors. And, um, you know, if you just think of, you know, for a second, you know, your, your cybersecurity program is sort of comprised of, you know, lots of different uh, components. There's, you know, things that you're trying to do to protect your endpoints. There's things that you're trying to do to, um, you know, defend your uh, your network. Uh, there are best practices that you're trying to do in terms of patching. All of these different um, components of a security program um, are data sets that BitSight is actually trying to collect um, about organizations. Uh, we We divide these into you know, the, the different categories that you're, that you're seeing here. But, you know, essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to continuously and non-intrusively collect this information about, about organizations. Um, you know, because we're collecting over time, we can start to see trends, you know, interesting developments over time. Um, and all of these things are updated on a daily basis, you know, depending on uh, what we're seeing about an organization at, at any given um, moment in time. And so all of this is, you know, is is really important to, you know, to think about and understand as we sort of dive into the, to the ransomware issue because um, the ransomware research that 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 I'll be sharing with you is all based on, you know, sort of BitSight's continuous observations um, about an organization and their uh, ongoing efforts to defend themselves uh, against bad things. So the last thing just to say about BitSight too is that we're also um, not only collecting security performance information, but we're also collecting information about an organization's technology dependencies or technology relationships. Um, and this has, of course, become you know so important. You know, you all are are certainly you know following stories about um, you know this idea of you know that that an organization's supply chain uh, can be at risk. We've certainly seen 
uh, over the course of the last nine months or so that there have been a number of you know really um, serious attacks targeting um, you know critical software vendors like Solar Winds, for example, or uh, earlier uh, this year, uh, obviously Microsoft and the Exchange servers were uh, the victim of a zero day um, attack, and so it's really important to um, for organizations to you know to to really start to understand their third-party dependencies, third-party relationships. So BitSight is actually collecting a lot of information that um, associates an organization with other technology service providers. So, you know, are you using, you know, what what types of hosting providers are you using? Do you rely on Amazon Web Services or Dyn DNS or Office 365 or SolarWinds Orion as an example? So we're collecting um, a lot of this type of information too, and we um, associate this data along with the security performance information uh, to specific, you know, organizations. Um, so that's essentially what what BitSight is doing, and um, I wanted to I wanted to start with that just so you can you know better understand what we're up to before I get into um, some of the ransomware research. So at a high level, you know, this has been um, I've I've. I've been involved with cybersecurity, um, as, as Alyssa, you know, sort of highlighted, um, for, for over 15 years now. And, um, uh, th this has certainly been, you know, every, every year has its own year or it has its own name. Uh, and, and this has certainly been the year of, of ransomware has really become a, um, a, a global, um, epidemic. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm sure many of your organizations are, um, are thinking about this? How do we defend ourselves? Um, you know, how do we address this issue? Certainly, there's um, been significant attention and focus by uh, senior executives and board members. Um, you know, these are just you know sort of ripped from the headlines. Um, you know, there's a lot of confusion. I think um, you know just in terms of you know some of the some of the uh, some of the things that the FBI has has actually been putting out over the last. Um, you know, number of years. On the one hand, you know, they're they're sort of saying, you know, not not to pay ransoms. On the other hand, acknowledging that everybody is uh, is sort of paying ransoms. Congress has um, has of course been um, been challenged to come up with you know sort of any any you know concrete proposals. In fact, the the latest has been um, you know a discussion about you know should we ban ransomware payments? Um, you know, what whatever happens. Uh, in the in the upcoming weeks and months, we we know that, um, that ransomware will not go away. It has become the um, attack um, of choice um, by a lot of malicious actors. Certainly, just the the way that um, ransomware has become automated um, has has helped make it ubiquitous. And and we know that these things were just going to continue um, in the uh, in the months and years ahead. The costs will certainly um, skyrocket, and that's of, co of course why um, NFP um, and others are spending so much time, uh, you know, working with you and your organizations about uh, things that we can do to mitigate um, some of these risks. Just to share some statistics, uh, this is from um, from Cambridge, um, the uh, the Judge Business School Center for for Risk Studies. They had done a really interesting um, data collection about. Um, the increase in um, cyber insurance claims. Uh, we've certainly seen, you know, from 2014 to 2019, you know, the bulk of claims were really around data exfiltration. Um, but this has, you know, dramatically changed in 2020, where malware and ransomware have just really taken over. You see a much more significant um, percentage of claims um, from from ransomware than anything else, and of course these are these are all over the headlines. There's been just a lot of coverage of this, so we don't need to um, you know we don't need to belabor the point. Um, a, a report that came out you know just a just a few months ago um, uh, uh, had ransomware cases increasing by 450 uh, percent year over year. So we know that this has become you know just a significant challenge, and one of the reasons why. Um, you know, we're, I think we're, we're seeing the emergence of uh, ransomware as, as, a, as, a, as a favorite attack is, is obviously the, the financial benefit, the financial gain um, for the attacker. But, you know, when you, when you look at the different tactics and extortion demands, you know, you can see that this, this is the type of, um, of attack that just can pay dividends 
multiple times. And I think that that's a, a really important thing just to keep in mind about why this attack, um, uh, um, this type of attack has become so, po so popular, uh, whether it's, you know, encryption and, you know, single extortion demands, um, uh, you know, which were sort of some of the some of the earlier uh, cases that we saw. And now, you know, you're seeing, you know, examples of double and triple uh, extortion, which is, you know, all right, so I'm going to encrypt your data if you don't pay me. Um, uh, but then if you don't pay me again, I'm going to exfiltrate your data. Um, and if you don't pay me again, uh, I'm going to um, uh, to create a denial of service attack uh, to bring you back uh, to the negotiation table. So, um, so there's just a lot of different options I think that that um, malicious actors are 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 looking at. And again, these are just you know it, it's it's just an example of how how this space is really evolving, which is that I can I can exact more and more money um, out of um, out of organizations, um, you know, than I, than I otherwise could. Uh, and that's what, wh why it represents such a, such a terrible, um, uh, you know, such a, uh, su such a terrible issue and why it's so important, obviously that organizations really spend the time to, um, you know, properly defend themselves, uh, against these types of attacks. So I shared with you a little earlier about the data that BitSight is collecting, um, based, you know, security performance information, which is all um, non-intrusively gathered um, about organizations. We're also collecting all of that telemetry about, you know, different technology providers, service provider relationships that organizations have. It said also collects a lot of um, publicly disclosed um, incidents. We are continuously gathering um, this kind of information. When I say publicly disclosed, you know, you all will recognize that there are some uh, cyber incidents that must be disclosed either to, you know, regulators, government agencies, et cetera. Um, these, you know, in, here in the U.S., these will go to, you know, the state attorneys general, for example, or sometimes to the SEC. Uh, sometimes these are, you know, these are, um, you know, disclosures. These are disclosures that are legally uh, required. Um, we, of course, know that, um you know, many cyber incidents, of course, go undisclosed, and that's actually part of a, a larger debate uh, that is taking place, um, you know, in the U.S. government and, and elsewhere um, among policymakers who are thinking about, you know, how do, you know, how can we um, require more disclosure uh, of these incidents? But what you're seeing here is um, uh, based on BitSite data collection uh, over the last three years. Um, the uh, the number of ransomware incidents that we have been collecting, that we've been observing, and the specific breakout by uh, by sector, uh, and you can certainly say apologies for the uh, for the, the the color shade. We could probably do a little bit better <laughs> um, uh, on the colors next time, but um, but you can see here. Obviously, these are uh, when you look at healthcare. Uh, the you know the the government and the education sectors these are all these are sort of three of the um, three the three sectors that have had the most number of publicly disclosed ransomware incidents. Why? Um, e in each case, they're they're legally required uh, to disclose some of these things, so it's not surprising that we're seeing more um, more public disclosures from these sectors. But certainly, you know, the the key takeaway from this chart is just to say that ransomware incidents are certainly on the rise. Um, uh, over the last number of years, but in particular, when you look at 2021 year to date, this was pulled um, about a month ago, we're, we're still seeing a significant number of incidents uh, taking place. So again, just sort of, um, you know, key, key takeaway here is, you know, similar to what is being publicly reported, we are, um, and privately reported, we are, we are seeing similar um, numbers based on our data collection. So what we wanted to do um, is we wanted to better understand, um, are there things that are happening inside of these ransomware victims? Are there security performance trends that we can better understand what separates a ransomware victim uh, from an organization that has, has, has been able to successfully avoid a ransomware incident? Are there certain characteristics? Are there certain trends? Um, are there certain performance issues um, that 
um, that that define a strong cybersecurity performer, um, maybe that define you know uh, who is more likely to experience uh, a ransomware incident. Are there things that we can observe from the data um, that may be leading indicators of experiencing a ransomware incident or avoiding uh, a ransomware incident? And so that's what I'm going to share with you uh, some of this research right now, or, you know, sort of what are the key issues that we've discovered are leading indicators of experiencing a ransomware incident? And then what are the things that, you know, that organizations should really be focusing on um, to avoid uh, becoming, uh, becoming the victim? And so I'll start um, just with some of the key findings, and we're just going to walk through them, you know, here over the next uh, number of minutes. So the key findings are if organizations maintain strong, consistent cybersecurity performance, and this is, again, sort of measured across all different types of categories of, of your program, that is, um, uh, that, that is shown to lessen the likelihood of experiencing a ransomware incident. Let, I'll say it again, strong, consistent security performance. You, you'll hear the term you know, security hygiene being thrown out um, by folks, you know, whether it's, you know, sort of the Gartners and Foresters of the world. Um, I, I used to cite a, a statistic from Gartner that said, uh, it, and this was um, uh, in 2019, they, they had put out a, a piece of research that said, you know, 90% of ransomware incidents could be prevented by implementing best practices. And, um, and, and that's exactly what the data shows too, is that this strong, consistent security performance actually lessens the likelihood of ransomware. It's something that you would, of course, um, you know, that, that, that seems like an obvious thing. The question is, well, how do I measure, um, you know, who, who is a strong, consistent security performer? Um, and that's where we, we've got some, some thoughts on that. So that's number one, strong, consistent security performance does um, uh, quantitatively lessen the likelihood of experiencing ransomware. Uh, issue number two, there are certain vulnerabilities that are closely tied with ransomware likelihood. These vulnerabilities are actually being actively uh, exploited by, um, by these ransomware gangs. And so when BitSight sees some of these vulnerabilities uh, and that those vulnerabilities are unpatched, it is another leading indicator that this is an organization that could or that has a higher likelihood of experiencing ransomware because these are the actual vulnerabilities that are being leveraged by the bad guys. So there are certain vulnerabilities that are closely tied. I'm going to share with you what those are. And then the third key finding is that when it comes to this you know, sort of very major program issue, which you would think of as patching or vulnerability management, these issues are critical components of a ransomware mitigation strategy. We actually find um, patching cadence, which I'm going to explain to you momentarily, um, which is sort of part of overall vulnerability, vulnerability management, is actually a crucial um, part of your security program and a crucial part of uh, reducing your likelihood um, of experiencing an incident. And I'll share that specific data here momentarily. Let me pause here for just a second before we get into the research. Um, Alyssa, just, just curious if, if there are any questions thus far, and, and if not, I'll just kind of keep going. Nope, no questions at this point. You can keep going. Okay, super. Okay, so let's start with uh, this issue about overall security performance. All right, so we talked a little bit earlier about, you know, that it was kind of, a, you know, when you, when, you, when you think about, well, of course, organizations that are strong security performers, they should be uh, able to um, better reduce their ransomware risk. And, and as it turns out, um, that, is, that is absolutely true. Um, when, when BitSight measures the overall security um, effectiveness uh, of an organization, as you know, we are using this 250 to 900 scale. 900 is, you know, um, excellent, consistent security performance, whereas 250 is a um, is a is a is a pretty terrible rating. That's you know consistently inconsistent, uh, you know security posture. There are lots of you know risky behaviors and things like that that we're observing. So what we did for this research is that we actually um, you know so we start we start with computing the organization's overall security rating, and we're looking across all of those different you know programmatic elements. Um, you know, do these, do these organizations have 
um, actual machine compromises, how many vulnerabilities do they have, and what is their exposure, what types of risky behaviors uh, are, they, are they running. What we did was we broke down our ratings into different, um, uh, into different categories. So we divided the world into those organizations who are 750 plus, 700 to 750, 650 to 700, 600 to 650, 500 to 600, and 300 to 500. And what we wanted to understand was, as we divide this world, who, which organizations were more likely to experience ransomware incidents based on, uh, based on their ratings? We started with the benchmark of 750 plus, okay? So what this chart is showing you is that organizations who are a 500 or lower are actually nearly eight times as likely to experience a ransomware incident relative to an organization who is a 750 plus. What, what's so fascinating about this is that, you know, we, we our, our data science team does, does a, has, has been doing um, a similar analysis, um, you know, looking at, um, you know, ongoing bit site ratings, comparing those ratings with those breach incidents that I, I mentioned earlier. Breach incidents are, of course, you know, it's not just ransomware, it's a lot of different stuff. Historically, bit site has found a strong signal in the 500 or lower um, rating. It, uh, what, what we've said historically is that organizations that are a 500 or lower are about five times more likely to experience incidents compared to organizations that are a 700 plus. The data science team was really blown away by just how, um, how, how the increased likelihood of ransomware changed um, for these lower performing organizations. In other words, there's a specific kind of cyber incident, a ransomware incident, that is even you know, more highly correlated um, with, uh, um, with the bit site rating uh, than, than traditional sort of cyber incidents that we observe. So this is the first kind of really interesting findings that when, when we look across the board at all of the different programmatic elements that go into um, an organization's cybersecurity program, we find that the lower performers have a very, um, uh, have, a, have a much increased likelihood of experiencing ransomware compared to the higher performers. Now, when we dive deeper uh, into some of those, you know, sort of very specific programmatic elements, um, what do we find? Um, in this particular um, slide that I'm about to share, we find that patching cadence really stands out um, as, a, um, as a trait uh, that, a, um, that a, a ransomware victim um, uh, is it, uh, that a, a ra ransomware victims have a much poorer rate of patching compared to um, non-victims. And so when we specifically look at this area called patching cadence, really what we're looking at is we're examining both the presence of these um, high confidence vulnerabilities. When I say, by the way, when I say high confidence vulnerabilities, what I mean is BitSight is uh, regularly scanning for vulnerabilities uh, for for folks who who have spent time in this world, you know that there are lots of different types of vulnerabilities out there um, uh, uh, in terms of um, in terms of criticality, right? There are some um, there there are some you know very critical uh, vulnerabilities, material vulnerabilities. There are some vulnerabilities that maybe aren't as uh, impactful. Maybe those are more moderate uh, vulnerabilities, and there's an entire uh, rating system that exists uh, to, you know, classify and quantify um, vulnerabilities themselves. What BitSight is doing is we're looking at literally hundreds and hundreds of different vulnerabilities, uh, again, from a, from a non-intrusive um, standpoint. And, we're, and, and those vulnerabilities include some of those, you know, high-risk critical vulnerabilities as well as some of the more moderate uh, vulnerabilities. And we collect all of that data and we use that data to create um, an assessment of an organization's what we call patching cadence, the rate by which you, um, uh, by which you patch your organization's systems and address vulnerabilities that you may have within your environment. So what you're seeing here on this chart is that organizations that are a D or an F uh, 
um, in the patching cadence risk vector as measured by BitSight are actually 7.3 times more likely to experience a ransomware incident uh, than organizations who are in A. And if you lump that C, D, or F um, categories, to, um, uh, ranges together, you'll see that that's a, those are very kind of strong, um, those are very strong indicators um, of breach. In other words, if you are average or below uh, at patching, you're much more likely uh, to experience um, a ransomware incident than if you are a strong uh, you have a strong vulnerability management program. This is another sort of really interesting finding. Um, and again, you know, I think that it's consistent with what we think uh, is, you know, should be true that an organization that has, you know, strong vulnerability management should be able to avoid um, these ransomware incidents. And this is, you know, essentially the, the data evidence that validates our assumptions. Another programmatic element that we looked at um, was, excuse me, involves um, how do we configure our security pro, uh, protocols, um, specifically when it comes to encryption standards. So when we look at TLS and SSL configurations, what we know is that if you incorrectly or weakly configure TLS SSL within your environment, it can make your servers vulnerable to certain attacks. And so what the data science team took a look at was, is this possibly a, a leading indicator um, of organizations experiencing uh, ransomware incidents, how well they are able to configure um, these particular issues? And at this point, I just want to point out that what we're saying about this, and so obviously what you're seeing here in the chart is that if you are a um, poor performer when it comes to configuring TLS SSL, you're actually more likely to experience a ransomware incident. What I want to say about this is that we're not saying that weak SSL configurations um, are the source of ransomware incidents, or they're not necessarily being exploited um, by, uh, by ransomware gangs. What we're saying is that when we observe um, weak configurations and weak certificate management, it's usually indicative of other security programmatic issues that an organization ex is experiencing. And so this is sort of the manifestation um, of a weaker security program uh, when we see these SSL uh, configurations that um, are, are, um, are incorrect or are weak. Now I wanted to share with you, um, uh, so, so, you know, in addition to doing some of this, um, some of this research, looking at, you know, looking at overall, you know, security programs, we, we also wanted to um, apply that research on a sector specific level. Um, so what the teams, what, what the team has done is, you know, we've, we've gone through the entirety of the BitSight inventory to sort of provide um, specific and unique breakouts um, of sector performance. And you know what are what are the things that we can learn um, about overall sector likelihood um, of experiencing ransomware? Of course, we know that you know it, this uh, this applies to individual organizations, but we we also wanted to sort of understand you know which sectors are sort of more likely to experience ransomware incidents because of the effectiveness of their security programs. And what we find um, you know is sort of a couple of kind of interesting uh, things that stand out. 20% of aerospace utilities and energy companies are actually at significant increased risk of ransomware due to their patching cadence. So when we look specifically at these sectors, these are sectors that, um, uh, you know, by and large, you know, I, I would say the, the majority of organizations um, may have, you know, strong um, patching programs in place, but we certainly see many examples in these three kind of critical sectors, um, many examples of organizations that do not necessarily have the strongest uh, patching programs in place. Nearly half of utilities that we observe are at increased risk of ransomware due to their patching issues. 4% of government and utilities are at an 
eight times increased risk of ransomware due to their overall security performance challenges. And so what that means is, you know, when we look specifically at the overall BitSite rating, um, we find that government and utilities organizations, you know, these are clearly organizations that are in that 300 to 500 range. Um, And so we actually see an uncomfortable number of government and utilities organizations that are in that range. And then, of course, you know, when we look specifically at a sector like food production, again, historically a sector that um, does not have um, a lot of legal requirements when it comes to cybersecurity, uh, maybe historically is, you know, has been in that sort of manufacturing um, mindset and is not necessarily, um, you know, spending a lot of time, energy, or resources on cybersecurity. We actually see that um, food production companies, um, are actually at increased risk of ransomware, more than 70% of them due to overall security performance challenges. And this has, of course, you know, kind of played its way out um, in some of the attacks that we observed, you know, even just a couple of months ago. All of this research, by the way, we're um, issuing new reports um, in the in the upcoming weeks, sector-specific reports. I've got my email here at the end if you're interested in a sector-specific report um, uh, impacting your sector. Now, the, we're, we're getting here towards, towards the end, and I wanted to um, share just a little bit about, so I, I mentioned the idea of patching cadence, which is the, the rate at which an organization patches, which is a really important um, part of avoiding uh, becoming the victim uh, of a ransomware incident. We specifically looked at um, these you know, specific vulnerabilities and whether specific vulnerabilities uh, were relevant to understanding the relationship between um, ransomware and vulnerability management. And so, you know, the high level is that we actually found a number of really interesting examples where the presence of a vulnerability, a, partic- a particular vulnerability, actually indicated a heightened risk of a ransomware incident. And let me highlight a couple just, um, uh, you know, quickly for you. When you look at these vulnerabilities on the left, that say Poodle and Drown. Um, these are um, long-standing vulnerabilities. You can see that this is the CVE is sort of like the date that it first came out. You know, it's this, you know, Poodle is from 2014, Drown is from 2016. So these are older vulnerabilities. Um, and if you remember what I was just saying a few minutes ago, you know, what we find this, similar to how we found with the um, TLS and SSL, you know, configurations and, and certificate management. These are actually examples of. Uh, vulnerabilities that we observe within organizations that may not necessarily be um, serious vulnerabilities, but they're indicative of poor patching practices or business constraints. In other words, it's not necessarily terrible that you have this vulnerability, but it suggests that there's, there's something else that's happening inside of the organization that you haven't even necessarily patched for this one, right? These are vulnerabilities that have been out for five, seven years. You know, the fact that your organization hasn't necessarily gotten around to it yet may be indicative that there's, you know, some, something, something at issue uh, with the overall patch, um, you know, patch management or vulnerability management program. When we look at other vulnerabilities, on the other hand, some of these more serious vulnerabilities, these may actually, may, may actually represent um, an attack vector into the organization. So if you look specifically at um, CVE 2018 13379. This is an example of a CVSS score of 9.8. So this is a you know, super critical material vulnerability. Um, the Pulse Secure group of vulnerabilities that BitSight is able to observe. These, um, this one in particular has a CVSS score of 10. And we know um, based on the public reports that um, malicious actors, ransomware gangs are actually actively leveraging these vulnerabilities uh, to deposit ransomware onto organizations. So on the one hand, Poodle and Drown are indicative, you know, they're, they're indicators of an overall sort of patch management program, but not necessarily uh, attack vectors themselves in, into the organization. On the other hand, some of these vulnerabilities uh, that, are, that, are, um, uh, that you see here are, th- these are the actual attack vectors in. And so when we see that, you know, an organization has 2018, 13, 379, for example, we would say, okay, not only do you need to patch that thing immediately, 
because it's a high risk vulnerability. But we know that there are ransomware gangs out there that are trying to exploit that. Uh, in fact, that maybe they've already exploited it and deposited the ransomware, you know, inside of your organization. So th- it, these are important things to keep tracking. Um, and again, you know, BitSight is sort of con- continuously collecting uh, information about, you know, hundreds and hundreds of different vulnerabilities. Um, so we'll and, and we'll be able to, you know, kind of change and update the research as we as we go into some of these things. Hey, Jake, we so um, we, just, do, we have yeah, a yeah. question. Uh-huh. Yeah, we have a question. Oh, um, yep. And the question is, when you say that those are higher risk for ransomware are not consistently patching, does this imply that the vendors have released the updates with patches, but the companies are failing to run them? I think there's um, a number of answers to that, but I'm going to defer to you first. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great point. So, um, yeah, yeah. So the answer on the on the patching, uh, key, the, you know, the way that the way that we assess patching cadence is typically, you know, is, is there is there a vulnerability out there? Is a patch out there? Has the organization applied the patch or not? You know, and and as um, you know, as as you can imagine, um, there are lots of different vulnerabilities that you can observe um, again from the outside you know as as, as bitsite does there are also a lot of vulnerabilities that you that that an organization like ours can't necessarily observe either because um, you know they're they're um, they're they're not public facing um, you know you would have to you have to actually you know exploit the code in order to do that. Of course, BitSight um, will, will, will never do something like that. So, so there, there, are, there are, of course, limitations to you know, what, we, what we can and cannot see from the outside. But when we look specifically at patching cadence, these are vulnerabilities that exist um, and patches that exist uh, that an organization has not applied. Now, let me give you a really quick example, though, of something that we've been following um, you know, for, for many months. It, it's this, uh, I mentioned it earlier, it's a Microsoft Exchange uh, server issue. So what happened in that situation was, um, you know, there was a zero day vulnerability uh, that was um, released when it came to these Microsoft Exchange servers. And so what a lot of um, what a lot of our customers wanted to know was, well, who? Okay, so who has these? You know, who has these Microsoft um, Exchange servers? Um, uh, e- even though there was no, there there, there wasn't even a patch. Uh, that that could be that could be deployed because what Microsoft had said was if you're running these specific versions, it's actually you know a, a really good chance you know you, you're you're sort of already hit with um, you know with this uh, with this zero day in this web shell. You know the bad guys were were sort of depositing um, these uh, these exploits, these back doors um, on on your system. And so what um, what BitSight was doing was we were helping our customers try to understand. Um, you know, who within their environment may have even been vulnerable um, to this particular issue, not even had they patched because the patch wasn't even available. Um, so this is just, you know, a little bit more of a complexity, I think, just behind, you know, some of, some of, these, um, some of these issues. So th- thanks, thank you so much for the, for the question. I just thank wanted to, 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 oh, I'm sorry, Alyssa. Um, no, no, go ahead. Yep, that was it. Thank you for okay. that uh, comprehensive answer. Okay. Absolutely, absolutely. So I just wanted to summarize, and again, you know, this, um, you know, this whole um, uh, slide deck, will, you know, will, will be available to you, so you can, you know, take a closer look at it. But just, just from a from a summary perspective, you know, what we're saying is um, your likelihood of being a ransomware victim it is actually closely tied with your overall security performance. Stronger performance, less likely. Does it doesn't mean, by the way, that that strong performers can't also be ransomware victims. Of course they can. Um, it just means that you are at a greater likelihood of of experiencing ransomware if you are a poorer security performer. So very important to sort of you know get a sense for your your overall security you know performance issues across a variety of different programmatic elements. We just talked on the left hand side about those vulnerabilities. Um, you know the specific vulnerabilities that are closely tied. Um, with ransomware gangs, but also, you know, the vulnerabilities that, you know, we see, um, and they've been around for a long time, not necessarily tied to a gang, but, but, but related to, you know, an organization's overall sort of patching cadence or patching uh, level. And then the specific risk vectors, you know, these are the sort of the programmatic areas that you really want to, you know, sort of focus on or pay attention to. Obviously, that patching cadence thing is so crucial um, in particular, because you know these ransomware gangs are exploiting vulnerabilities against against you, and so it's really important to 
um, to, to improve your, um, you know, your patching cadence or your patching rates, um, to consistently move these, uh, move these patches out, you know, in, into your entire, um, environment. So, um, so this, so the summary, um, which I, <laughs> which I just kind of mentioned is, um, you know, th this whole hygiene thing really does matter. Um, you know, vulnerabilities, um, you know, patching, you know, these are things that, um, pro probably are not the sexiest things uh, when it comes to cybersecurity, but it's do being able to do that consistently over time that's really going to, um, you know, be a, a crucial factor in your ability to avoid um, uh, to avoid ransomware, at least reduce the risk. Right, that's really what we're um, what we're what we're talking about. We talked about these certain vulnerabilities. Really, um, you know, this third this third bullet. I just want to spend a second on this. When we think about when we think about this idea of daily security program performance and, and the fact that that matters, you know, I, I think the bottom line here is what we keep seeing is this, this problem is not going away. Right. And, and so, um, you know, really, really what we're trying to get to from a programmatic standpoint is like, how, how can, how can I build an effective security program that, is going to be able to meet the the next challenge that's coming, um, and and that's really what I what I mean by you know we we have to move beyond this whole whack a mole thing to to more sort of holistic program management. Um, you know the whack a mole is like oh my gosh you know Microsoft Exchange okay like patch that okay good all right we patched it oh phew you know um, but th this is this is more about like just being able to develop that consistency in performance, consistent execution. Um, it's no longer the whack-a-mole thing. It's, you know, okay, of course something is going to come up tomorrow and I'm going to be ready to do that thing when it comes up tomorrow. It doesn't mean that you're going to avoid everything. It just means that, you know, by developing that, you know, muscle memory, um, you're going to better reduce your risk. And then the final thing is, you know, the, the more I've talked to folks, um, you know, just over the last, um, you know, number of months, just on this ransomware issue, the, the, the more, the more that I've discovered that, you know, a lot of organizations do feel very comfortable in the programs that they've created. Um, but, but then it's really, you know, thinking about your third parties, you know, the supply chain and, um, you know, and I, I've, I've talked to, I've talked to countless folks, uh, just over the last number of months that have said, you, you wouldn't believe um, how I was impacted by a ransomware incident. It was a ransomware incident targeting my, you know, a, a critical vendor. Um, and they were knocked offline for, you know, for days or weeks. Uh, and there was nothing that I could do about it. And so, you know, really sort of understanding, um, you know, that third party ecosystem, the vendor ecosystem, the folks who you're working with, and then, you know, ultimately being able to monitor them, work with them to improve. Uh, their own security performance. That's, that's really what we're trying to get to at the end of the day. So don't forget, it's not just about you. Um, it's about all those third parties um, that you're working with. And so I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. The last thing I'll just say is um, if you are interested in, you know, some of this sort of, you know, whether it's company or sector specific, um, you know, information, you know, please feel free to, to email me at the, um, at the email address here. And um, uh, with that said, I, I, I hope I didn't talk too quickly, but um uh, there's a lot to cover. Alyssa, I will turn it back over um, to you for any questions. Great. We um, we don't have a couple of questions, but I just have a couple of questions that are just some things you touched on that I think might be um, insightful for the for the audience and those on the call. And I know these are going to be very, very general questions, but I would just say, based on your experience, obviously, and what you've seen, um, are there specific industries that you have seen in your, um, you know, in, in your time at BitSafe that you see generally tend to have less sophisticated, not sophisticated, but less security that might make them more vulnerable? And I know we talked a lot about the ways in which they can increase their increase their cybersecurity posture and make them less of a target. But I'm just curious. I, I know I, I generally tend to say the yeah. more sophisticated entities or those that are more regulated just because they have to be. And I kind of get my right. hands back for saying that, but I'm, I'm curious in your perspective, if you can generally speak to kind of, you know, your, just your thoughts on that. Yeah. Yeah, no, no. So, so first of all, I mean, the, 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 the data kind of bears that out, which is that, um, you know, some of these heavily regulated sectors like the financial sector, for example, I mean, really, really are 
stronger security performers across the board. I mean, you know, and, you know, I've shared, you know, today just all the different, you know, sort of, you know, categories, you know, that, that, that we're looking at. And, you know, you look at somebody like the, you know, like the, like the financial sector and, and you, you know, you can even go deeper. You can look at, you know, you know, different subsectors and, and that's, you know, part of what you can do um, from a benchmarking standpoint is, um, you know, is to actually really leverage this data to benchmark yourself against, um, against others. So, so it, it, it's definitely true that, that the financial sector is an example of a regulated um, uh, industry that is a, that is a strong performer. I, I would also say, though, that um, there, there are a couple examples of, you know, regulated sectors that maybe aren't really doing as well as as we might think. Um, and, you know, I just kind of specifically call out like, um, you know, utilities and healthcare are are two examples where I think that there I think that there is probably a distinction between, you know, some of these kind of, you know, larger um, you know, more sophisticated, um, you know, organizations in those sectors, uh, you know, folks who can afford to, you know, spend a lot of money and they've got, you know, a ton of governance around this and things like that, um, you know, compared, compared to others. So we actually, and I'm, I'm, I'm still concerned, I think is what I'm trying to say about the, the higher rates, um, of you know vulnerabilities and infections that, that I see in those sectors because we obviously know how how critical they are. Um, there are other examples I would just kind of highlight as um, areas that you might think are are not as good but are actually really good. And so um, one of those sectors is actually the legal sector. Uh, and I've always been really surprised by this because um, you know and, and again. Um, I, I don't mean to say that, you know, law firms um, haven't been breached because they have. <laughs> we've got we've got many examples of that. But what I would say is that the legal sector um, as a whole is actually um, one of the strongest performing sectors uh, that we see at Pitsite. Now, why is that? It's not because they're regulated, um, but I, I actually think it has a lot to do with the um, the level of attention and contractual requirements that some of these sectors place on their law firms. So if you think about like, you know, what a major financial institution will legally require uh, its law firm to, to be doing from a security um, perspective, um, you know, can, can actually be very onerous. Um, and, you know, this was not that, you know, when, when I first started looking at this, you know, five or six years ago, I would say that, you know, legal was not a particularly strong performer, but we've really seen that change over the last five years. We've seen the legal sector really, you know, become, you know, one of, if not the strongest performing sectors as a whole. So I'm saying all this because, it, you know, it, it, there, there, there's something, there's something to the regulation, there's something to the contractual requirements. Um, but I also think that, um, the last thing I'll just say is, I, I also think that just because you're a large organization, um, you know, maybe with a lot of budget, does not necessarily mean that you're a better security performer. In fact, you know, when you're a large organization with a lot of, um, with, a, with a big attack surface, you know, you, you just have a lot more to defend. And so that's the other thing I would, um, I would share with, um, you know, with the group is that we actually see that some of these, you know, major Fortune 1000 um, companies across a variety of sectors um, actually don't necessarily have strong security performance it's not because they're not you know investing time and resources into it it's just that they have so much to defend um and so that's just an, another interesting spin on it that's great um thank you so much for obviously for that additional insight um one very last question just before we run out of time um i'm just curious because there's so much discussion and there's so much risk around third-party vendors and i know you touched on it very briefly towards the end i'm just kind of curious um if based on you know, obviously the algorithms that you guys run and, and kind of the metrics that you see, are there any sort of best practices? And I know this is probably more of a legal question, but just, you know, any any sort of best practices that you have with respect to supply chain vendors that you can touch on in like yeah. two minutes or less? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll give the two minute version. <laughs> um, I'll definitely give, give the two minute version. Um, so so there, there's a, there are a couple of very specific things that every organization should be doing when it comes to third party uh, risk management. I mean, one is you've got to be doing some sort of um, diligence or, you know, risk assessment um, of organizations. And, you know, historically, the way that people approach this was, 
you know, I'm going to send out a questionnaire. I'm going to ask you to fill out a lot of stuff. That's still happening. Um, I would just say that, you know, increasingly, you know, folks are, are thinking of spending, you know, less time on that because, you know, we, there, there's just sort of less, you know, people have, have learned how to fill out a questionnaire at this point. Um, and so the, the data that you're able to glean from, you know, from a third party via a questionnaire is, you know, it's, these are sort of good kind of, you know, compliancy things to do, but it's not necessarily great from a risk management standpoint. So but you've got to have some sort of, you know, some sort of, you know, risk assessment. Um, you've got to focus on the, um, this tiering uh, issue, which is, you know, you, you want to be spending the bulk of your time with the organizations that represent, you know, the, the most risk to you. And so here's an example. SolarWinds, SolarWinds is, a, is a software provider that, um, you know, not a lot of folks thought was a critical vendor until something bad happened to SolarWinds and people realized, oh my gosh, they actually have like all of this access to all of our most sensitive information. Um, so it's really important to get that tiering process right. You really need to think hard about who, which of these, you know, third-party vendors that I'm working with, contractors, et cetera, which of these are critical to me? You have to do a, a really sort of robust criticality assessment. You know, who's, who's important? Do they have my sensitive data? Do they have, you know, um, you know, important network access, et cetera? The third thing you really need to do is you need to think about this um, from a continuous monitoring perspective, because once you've, you know, once you've done the assessment, once you've signed the contract, and by the way, in the contract, you've got to, you know, bake in, you know, your, your, your terms and requirements and expectations. But once you've done that, you know, the risk doesn't go away. So you want to be able to, you know, to continuously monitor what's happening inside of, um, of a third party's environment. But why? Why do you want to know that? Because you want to know that so you can avoid issues from occurring, right? That's the whole, the whole point of continuous monitoring, which sometimes gets lost on, on folks is I'm doing this for a reason. The reason is when, when I start to see risk emerge, I want to be able to have my third party address that risk immediately. And um, one of the key lessons that we've learned is, look, you, you can't count that everybody else who's working with this vendor is going to do this. Like, you, you know, we, we all really need to take uh, responsibility um, for, you know, reaching out and engaging um, with some of these vendors. And it doesn't really matter how big or small you are. I mean, it's important to, uh, it's important to be doing this just so they, you know, you can start to create some level of accountability there. So those are kind of the three, um, sort of the three main areas that I'd focus on. It's, you know, the, the risk assessment, the, you know, the criticality um, engagement slash discussion, and then the, um, the continuous monitoring piece. That's great. Th thank you so much. Um, so we're just about out of time. So I'm just going to close it out and say, um, you know, Jake, thanks so much for that really informative presentation um, for everybody on the call. As I mentioned earlier, BitSight's a trusted partner for several cyber insurance carriers and companies, and they're an invaluable resource truly in helping your organization manage your cybersecurity posture, um, performance, and, and much more. If you're interested in learning more about how BitSight can help your business, please reach out to myself your local NFP broker or Jake directly. I know Jake pointed out very kindly, his email was in that last slide and certainly um, I can make that available to everybody. Um, just a quick follow-up, um, a recording of today's presentation will be available within 48 hours. Um, please also be on the lookout for a short survey following today's presentation that will pop up in a separate window upon the close of the webinar. So with that, I wanna formally close it out. Thank everybody for joining us today. Thanks so much, Jake and everybody um, enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Bye-bye.